Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the Tokenomics podcast. We're live again and uh, I'm your host, Tanya Alexander, and I have a very special guest today. I'm talking to Galia Wessler. Galia, welcome to the Tokenomics podcast. I'm very happy and excited to talk to you today. Thank you so much, Annie. It's so lovely to be here today. It's uh, it's very uh, you know very nice to to be able to connect to people from the space and thank you so much for responding really fast. We basically did this about we connected about two days ago or something like that. So uh, it's really exciting to just um, do it really fast and 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 get connected uh, in such an easy way. So thank you for responding straight away. Absolutely. Uh, so Galia, I, I know like the space is so young that very often when we are talking to people, most of them did something else before they got into the space. So would you like to kind of introduce uh, yourself uh, pre-blockchain uh, times of your uh, life? Absolutely. So it wasn't that long ago. It, I, we actually got into the space uh, at the beginning of last year in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit uh, after the hype was at its peak, and then it started to diminish, unfortunately. Yeah. I've been in technology space for the past, uh, I would say, 12 years now, uh, without disclosing my age too much. <laughs> <laughs> I can Wait, tell you that. Um, yeah. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I've actually studied uh, software engineering. I'm originally from Israel, but I'm Canadian born. Uh -huh. uh, I got my, my education uh, in Tel Aviv and I decided to go to software development and I've worked for a couple of years. I climbed the corporate ladder as a senior product manager, uh, working a lot with clients and working in different uh, corporations and then getting into the startup world up until I got, uh, I got, I got bitten by the entrepreneurial uh, bug. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've been sick. <laughs> Absolutely loving it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because everyone I spoke to before who kind of passed that river and got to the other side, uh, it feels like there's no turning back. Even when you end up with some failures and even when things don't really go smoothly, which they never do in the entrepreneurial journey, uh, no one actually wants to go back to nine to five. So, uh, it, I, I mean, I can totally relate to that. So, um, so you, I mean, the tech space is is quite hectic in general entrepreneurship is even harder like in even harder to to look at it that way so um how are you managing the the whole pressure of it plus you know uh blockchain is is even a younger sphere so there is a lot of learning curve how how, how yeah. easy it was for you to to learn the the new sphere and get into it yeah, so no, I have to say that from a bird's eye view, it kind of looked like things are very glamorous because a lot of people, when they follow me, I have uh, um, you know different different followers from around the world, and and they see me traveling, especially now because there's so many things that are happening, in yeah. particular in Europe, which is where I'm at right now, um, and uh, and I also did a, a quite a big TEDx in Vancouver, and I talk about social media and loneliness, so everything sort of like intertwines together and. Um, and I always say to people that even though it seems like, you know, we take the, the perfect selfies and the perfect videos, I, I don't know if this video is very perfect right now with this like awkward light on top of my head. Um, but, you know, we try, we try to be a little bit more uh, than what we are actually are in reality. But um, it kind of seems from far away that as an entrepreneur, there's like a really big mountain and that entrepreneur along with their team is climbing that mountain. And it's true, like from a bird's eye view, we are making very, very huge leaps in the blockchain space and particularly the blockchain for business. And it does seem like we're going up, but the people that they know me uh, quite well and they kind of like zoom in on what we're doing and in particularly myself being a CEO and a co-founder, the zoom in picture is not, it's not that glamorous actually, uh, pretty stressful times. Um, it's very difficult, uh, the life of the entrepreneur because even though it seems like you're going up, actually when you zoom in, it's going up and down and up and down and up and down. Yeah. And that really is when you climb a mountain, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what was it in blockchain that actually attracted you, attracted you to the space? Because uh, I know many people for whom the first entry point has been the different cryptocurrencies they got introduced to or yeah. some platforms. Like in my case, it was Steemit. I started writing on Steemit and then got in, you know, completely into a different direction. So what was it that attracted you to the space? Yeah, so, you know, Plaza started as a DIY tool for people in the audience that are not familiar DIY is do-it-yourself. We've been doing do-it-yourself tools mainly for businesses uh, for the past couple of years. I have another company called To Galvanize. And really what that means is you want to give the power back to the people, and particularly to business people, where if you think about better examples are, for example, Wix, uh, which is do-it-yourself website. What we were doing with Plaza is do-it-yourself app, in particular with social network app where you can get away from the ever-changing Facebook algorithms, and especially what happened with the big Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, um, and with, with the Trump campaign as well, and everybody knows about the fake news and everything that's happening. Um, actually, uh, in March of 2018, uh, lots of, when, when, that, when that happened, lots of media articles, TechCrunch and all the big ones, they were writing about the Facebook wall and how can you overcome the Facebook wall, uh, possibly using blockchain. So that's sort of how we started. So, when I first heard about blockchain, it was uh, the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, where I started adding to the team uh, blockchain advisors. And then afterwards we found blockchain specialists and architects that have, uh, well, back then they had one year experience, which was considered to be a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, of course, they have two plus years experience. They're absolutely brilliant, uh, brilliant developers and architects. And so what we did is we, we realized that the fundamentals of the blockchain philosophy were you want to create an ecosystem where you give the power back to the people for them to be able to own, control, and monetize in particularly about data. And data issues is something that, you know, uh, what happened with the Facebook uh, um, profile was that it actually evolved to be what we see today, especially in Europe, obviously, with GDPR and anything, everything that has to do with uh, data protection uh, with, and user privacy and how are you able to protect those users. So the way we started was as a decentralized communication protocol that allows people to own control and monetize on their data. Um, so what we did is we integrated our solution um, into different projects and allowed them to really have sort of like a channel. So it was almost like a solution for almost like a Facebook group, a community where you allow the members of the community to chat uh, in that channel and then using, it's a, it's a really well-known blockchain use case where you do peer-to-peer -peer trades and you also do customer loyalty on the blockchain. So what it means is that once you're able to own your data and say, for example, you are publishing now this post and we're live on LinkedIn, actually uh, none of this belongs to us. So if LinkedIn decided that we say the word crypto, 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 and all of a sudden they, they decide to ban us because you cannot say crypto on LinkedIn. And I'm just giving an example. Uh, what that really illustrates to you is that even though you're recording it and I've consented to be on this, on this podcast, None of this belongs to us. So with, with the communication protocol that we developed, we actually allow people to own their data. And then the way they monetize on it is if they're able to promote the brand. Uh -huh. And what we did is we built it on top of Telegram so they can launch it with Telegram. And then they can promote these posts on Telegram, on Twitter, on Facebook. So actually using regular social networks, they end up earning different things. So when you talk about customer loyalty or blockchain, they can earn points, they can earn Bitcoins, they can earn Ether, they can earn uh, just uh, just regular recognitions, maybe it's some sort of a discount for whichever thing that they're part, whichever community they're part of. And this was a way to use a combination of smart contracts and also a decentralized manner for them to own their data and then do something with it. So then what happened after we developed the, uh, the protocol, we actually did start uh, by doing um, an ICO um in 2018 and we started it so we finished the white paper in and around march uh, may uh, sorry uh, april may uh -huh. and then we started doing i did like a world tour starting to do an ico and mind you we're a canadian company um in and around uh june late june july i went to all the different uh different locations especially in asia um and we were able to raise uh funds with it but one of the problems that we saw was because the hype and the bubble was bursting. Yeah. Um, a lot of the companies were not able to get investors, um, including ourselves. We weren't able to achieve our goals. 
Um, mm-hmm. And what we also saw that other, other entrepreneurs were doing is that they were trying to raise uh, money with a white paper, so basically with a theory. So I said this in the other podcast the other day with Shachan is that one of the advice that you give an, an entrepreneur and in, in, in a group of really talented people is that even though your theory could be absolutely amazing and perfect and you can build uh, different dreams for yourself and for your team, at the end of the day, you have to really measure it with what are you actually going to implement, right? From a technology perspective, from a marketing yeah. perspective. And what we did is, is we didn't rely on the investment that we actually got, is we went ahead and we decided to invest ourselves uh-huh. into building the team and into building the communication protocol. And as we were uh, finishing, uh, well, the first version of the protocol in and around September, we already lined up different projects. It was actually to promote ICO projects back then to integrate with a protocol to really see if the hypothesis, because it's an hypothesis when you start something in a startup, the hypothesis in the white paper, can it actually be true when you go ahead and implement it? So what happened was we implemented it and then I, I keep on uh, performing on stages because of the TEDx experience, because I've been mm-hmm. a public speaker for a long time. And, and they, there's different media um, articles written about me. And so it's very unique, we can talk about the whole women. It's very unique to have like a female entrepreneur and all these, uh, all these different uh, stories about women in, in technology. And that's why I had the pleasure and the opportunity to be on those stages and talk about blockchain. So I, yeah. I talked about our communication protocol, but I wasn't trying to sell it because I already knew based on our advisors that you kind of mm-hmm. have to dim it down. You probably will not actually fully launch the ICO and you yeah. probably will not be able to finish, uh, to finish that round. So what I ended up doing is I ended up talking about this magnificent technology from an education standpoint of how you can move and protect your digital assets, your diff- digital data, which, which cryptocurrency is just one example and you can have so many other examples. So yeah. as we're getting on the stage, uh, companies started uh, approaching me and my team, and they said, this is amazing. A, how can we integrate it to our project? And the other thing that, which was really interesting is how can we do it for our company? How do we get to have security audits? How do we do analysis if blockchain is good for us? What do you mean by digital assets? Can we use digital assets in different things? In mm-hmm. HR, in cross-border, in insurance, in healthcare, right? And this is how really the company did, um, I would say, uh, sort of like a pivot where instead of focusing just on the protocol and just on the project, we had to, we had to provide something much bigger. Yeah, exactly. And we, and, we, and we had to provide to ourselves because there was, there was no more investment with an ICO. I mean, it was very clear by September, October, November, it was done. The show was completely done. And, and the companies that managed to sort of survive Mm-hmm. And turn it around in a way that is very, very significant. I'm uh, talking about a company that is now not just relying on investment, but is actually making revenue. Is mm-hmm. actually a, a, an absolute miracle. I think it's very impressive because you touched on several points, and I would like to go back to that. Uh, is uh, you know, as you said, uh, very in in many cases, the projects that they were raising by ICOs were actually writing just a dream and and a white paper that sounded like a fiction. Uh, so uh, it, it and and I think um, th- very often the the projects were, which raised during the hype with that you know uh, white paper without validating the idea without having a very good uh, idea of how to implement the project and how to build the thing because it was more wishful thinking rather than actual research and actual validated idea. Um, even even when they raised the money, the money didn't really solve the issues because they didn't have the fund- foundation, the right foundation in place. So mm-hmm. I, I have a feeling that you know, although you you know, it was the wrong times for raising uh, through the ICO, and it didn't work out. But it it sort of probably it pushed you to make things faster and to to address most of the things in in a better manner and and probably if you had raised that money through the ICO things wouldn't well, be you, you, you would have had to give it back right you would have had to give it back so a lot of the the stories that I've heard and I can't say this for a fact because until you validate something it's probably unreal but I did hear that investment firms um, that of course we were looking to get them involved as part of our round they've they've lost their business because the companies that they were supporting lost their business 
and then the the entrepreneurs and the and the companies that actually raised everything if they raised it in cryptocurrencies and that lost their value they they lost their investment right and yeah. then if they if they raise it with uh with selling tokens and then getting getting fiat in return they had to return the fiat because if they can't support the ico if they can't go ahead with the token um it's it is it is an offense right so yeah. it's it's either they uh they completely close their company and maybe they go bankrupt i don't know and mm -hmm. then we don't have to give the money back to the investors but i can tell you especially from our experience is that the money that we raise with selling our tokens when we thought about doing your tilde token which is for the plazas protocol we had to give it back uh well i mean it's it's i think it's very rare when when you see that level of ethics and moral in this space unfortunately so i'm i'm, I'm very happy to to see these things happening because it kind of you know it 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 helps the space look much better than it usually seems from the first glance right when when people are getting into blockchain or are becoming interested in to blockchain at this point of time what they do is they do just basic research right and unfortunately when they do a research in places like twitter or they go to some events which have been hyped a lot and see certain speakers around that or you know see certain articles around the blockchain space there are loads of uh, bad publicity around and it's very hard to filter the good and the bad and in general it scares people off sometimes it still does unfortunately so um i know that these kind of things don't happen very often so i really uh, appreciate uh, projects like yours who are responsible and ethical in the space uh and i also think that um you know things are becoming better with with the uh, with the fact that the hype is gone and now it feels like a better quality projects are still around because those who who didn't think things through or weren't really uh, good enough in terms of uh, preparation in advance um, are not around. Do you have the same feeling that the quality has changed and things are a yeah, bit better absolutely. now? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that even when we were thinking about and starting the path of doing an ICO, uh, it was filtering down. And even the investors, the way they look at it is they look at it as to who is in your advisory board, who is in your team, Mm -hmm. um what what do you actually have do you actually have like a poc uh or even an mvp a uh, minimum viable product available that they can see and try but you know it's the same advice like if i was on the other end if i was like investing in those startups it's the same advice right even if you give them okay so you don't give them tokens you give them equity right you don't do an sto you do an ipo whatever you do you have to basically uh have visibility as to how you're doing your business and you mm -hmm. can't just rely on the the different theory that you have is the really important piece is if you are able to in, invest yourself in your business mm -hmm. and with your partners do you have a revenue model yeah. because if you don't have a revenue model i mean in today's day and age where financial crisis in in some parts of the world is already happening and it's about to impact the rest of the world how can you do a business without a revenue model i mean that's in the and, and back and back in 2017 a lot, a lot of projects it's not that they didn't think about it but it was the investors when they got really excited they invested in all these uh projects and the public investors as well they never stopped and thought how is this project going to get the return of investment and how is this project going to contribute to the world you know and, and i'm not just talking about changing you know healthcare, changing banking how do, we, how do we take the that? markets? <laughs> yeah. yeah, how do we take the unbanked in Africa and becoming banked in Africa? You know, a lot of the things that we're doing yeah. is we're actually doing this for medium-sized companies. And we take this really big concept and we try to sort of like narrow it down, first of all, to something that a person can understand and, and consume mm -hmm. with regards to blockchain. And secondly, practically, how are you going to add integrity, visibility, and transparency around different business processes where you don't necessarily have to cure the world the way projects were trying to do that because at the end of the day, like what is the problem that you're solving and, and how are you gonna make money? Yeah, uh, you mentioned about uh, GDPR and owning your own data and also being able to monetize your data. I really love this concept because these days, uh, by many, many platforms, our data has been completely, um, uh, 
you know, utilized in, in any shape and form and kind of we have been uh, uh, manipulated many times uh, due to the fact that they, they had access to our data. So um, very beautiful kind of concept to, to get that back. Everyone would love to, to own it back uh, because it, it, it ultimately belongs to us, right? Um, what is the impact on the brands? Because you spoke about basically if you own your data, you are uh, keeping control of who you are willing to share it with, right? Mm -hmm. um, does it put, do you think it puts pressure on brands to do better in terms of, uh, you know, uh, taking care of their user base, thinking about their user and eventually uh, kind of uh, get the, the, the genuine loyal people around them and depending on them ultimately. Yeah, that's right. So if you go back to the TEDx that I did about three years ago, you can take a look of how when you look at it from a very high level perspective, one of the problems in the world is loneliness, right? And the fact that social media really makes it very extreme because you think that if somebody is not liking our post right now, um, automatically thinks that we're not popular enough and whatever yeah. that other nonsense is. But the, one of the messages, the key messages that I had in my TEDx is in order to overcome loneliness, we have to do things with a purpose. And that is really the whole, the whole, um, the whole notion about communities, right? Uh -huh. So brands can adopt the same idea. If brands are trying to pay influencers on Instagram, it's kind of like when the hype of the ICO was happening, let yeah. me pay a certain uh, agency, uh, I don't know, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, I'm exaggerating, dollars a month in order to pay Forbes to put me in some yeah. sort of a whatever middle page in yeah. order to promote my project, right? So a lot of it revolves about fakeness. A lot of it revolves about things that are not real. So if brands are trying, and of course, they still need to go like uphill into the, the fightings of the Instagram of Facebook, which is exactly the same algorithms and LinkedIn yes. is exactly the same. So how do you differentiate yourself? So the, the first thing that they have to do is they have to realize what are the smaller communities that my brand can uh, relate to certain people. So if, for uh -huh. example, you have on your shirt, you have the Dare brand yeah. and Dare to be, Dare to be a different brand is for particularly for women that are in their twenties and they are maybe like young moms and they're doing uh, whatever media, different roles, if they're able yeah. to really cater to that specific community, they're able to rise themselves above yeah. the crowd and have meaningful conversations. So the way you do that is if you want to do that on the blockchain, one of the things that you can do is actually create a channel where the data is decentralized. And yeah. what we have implemented with the decentralization um, and the automation piece was every time you let these women that are 20 years old that are you know supporters of the dare to be different brands yeah. uh, promote it in the different uh, social networks that they mm -hmm. have. The brand can give them like brand ambassador fifty percent off every second every second t shirt that they buy. Yeah. But a lot of the work that the brand has to do, it, it has nothing to do with the technology, but it has everything to do with the strategy and how they're able to uh, relate their brand to their users in a meaningful yeah. way. So that's number one. Number two is. Um, if the brand decides to put it in a decentralized uh, protocol or in some sort of a tool, because we're also integrating this into their own private blockchain, now yeah. they have the opportunity to let their users monetize on their data with, say, advertisers in a way that they control it and not the platform that they're at, right? So if you decide to promote your brand on Facebook, which is, or Instagram, which is, you know, one of your only choices right now, uh -huh. You're essentially giving, as a user and as a brand, you're giving the control, the monetization, and everything that you have to that brand. So that's a consideration for them to think about things a little bit differently. So, and I can talk about uh, specific projects if you'd like. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll get to that now. I just would like to mention that I think it's. Uh, it makes things harder because growing and, and nurturing a genuine, authentic community around your brand is very hard. And you, you, you probably have to really care about your users and, and, and show and make them feel that somehow, which is what you mentioned, just, you know, uh, taking care of the ambassadors and giving them back something in return. Um, but also on the long term, I think those human brands are going to be the ones that are going to win at the end of the day because uh, 
everything else kind of becomes standard, becomes normal, and it's repetitive, and we get immune to those. Like, you know, there, are, there have been different surveys stating that millennials are immune to advertising. They have become very skeptical. Mm -hmm. They prefer things that have some purpose behind it, and they're not so easily convinced these days. So I think, yes, it takes, it's the harder approach, but in the long term, those brands who actually make it in, in that space, the way you are describing it, those are going to be the brands which will stick around for much, much longer. So I, I would love to get some examples, real life examples of those who are doing it. It would be nice to hear that. Yeah, for sure. So I, I touched upon it in the other podcast and there's different, uh, different articles written about it. So there's a project that we're now doing the proof of concept to them. And it's a project in Mexico where they have a few universities there and union workers and union organizations where uh, that startup wanted to create some sort of a digital coin. And uh -huh. I said this last time for people that actually understand blockchain technology, they know that digital coin is not a cryptocurrency. Yeah. Um, it's not a cryptocurrency because it's not using uh, the same mechanism of the blockchain just to deliver the coin. It's actually delivering the coin as an equal of a, of a regular currency. So for them, they attach it to the FESA because they're in Mexico. And then what they do, they're able to control uh, giving the uh, the salaries and the scholarships for the students and the union workers. And the idea behind it is that they wanted to create some sort of a private blockchain where when you have a private blockchain, you're able to invite different participants and to give them different um, different view and edit and different rights, permission mm -hmm. rights yeah. into the blockchain. And the reason why they wanted to do that is because to create a marketplace where students are able to receive their scholarships and do peer-to-peer -peer trades using their plans protocol, and also to interact with advertisers, the, the, the essentials, which is how do they get that coin? How do they even able to make sure that they're receiving the right amount, that they're able to pay with those right amounts? In order uh -huh. to do that, you need to have a lot of transparency. And one of the problems in Mexico and many countries like that is that cash is king, which means yeah. that they get their salaries in, in, uh, in cash and uh -huh. then they walk around uh, in the in the in the real world, and they get mugged, uh, whichever the dates when they get their salaries, the first and fifteenth of the month, and so they become really vulnerable. They become really vulnerable for for two reasons. Number one, because when you carry cash, you're vulnerable. Number two is when they do need to interact with the banks, they charge them hefty, huge yeah. fees, and they absolutely detest uh, the banking system. And so uh, this project is really interesting because it allows them to have a digital wallet with a digital coin where they can get their, um, their, their scholarships with a certain amount. And it also allows for the university as one of the players to be able to see what the students are doing with that coin. So for example, yeah. they can set up different rules together because it's almost like a corporation. And they uh -huh. can say that the students can only buy books so they can only sell services of classes for one another. So if I study software engineering and you happen to need help with math and, uh, and in return, I would like for you to help me with algorithms, we can do that trade. So imagine um, marketplaces like Fiverr, people uh -huh. don't know Fiverr, you're yeah. allowing, the, you're allowing the, the people to interact with one another, to trade the services. And then as they're naturally chatting and, and communicating on this marketplace, now they can bring the big advertisers. So they have, for example, PepsiCo, they have really big advertisers. They also have vendors, uh -huh. Telcel and all the, all, this, all the cell phone companies and all the uh, insurance companies and all the companies that are giving the students and the union workers different services. Now they can come in and they can decide with the, with the Plaza's protocol, what is it that they want to market to, to the students based on their preferences. And that's yeah. a really good example of how do you combine everything. But if you know this, this is essentially, even though it's a few millions of users, it really is a specific community with specific purpose yeah. to it. And that's why the potential for this to work really well has to do with the strategy of how do you take a really big social network, dissect it into smaller one, give them a tool where it's decentralized and there's integrity around the financial transactions. Mm -hmm. So it's not about delivering the coin, it's about yeah. how do you create integrity? So for example, another party can be an auditor, a Mexican government auditor. They can come in and they can see that the students, in fact, based on the contract, got a thousand pesos a month. 
right? Yeah. And, it, and it's based on the budget of 1 million pesos uh, a year, for example. So they can see all of yeah. that and that's how you create um, uh, systems that are audit friendly as well. I think it's beautiful because it, it sort of showcases few things here, uh, apart from the fact that it's very useful and it brings a difference to people's everyday life. It's also sort of, we have all these talks about how to reach mass adoption, right? And yeah. um, and I think, you know, you mentioned that it's, it's although it's, you know, it's um, touching many people, but it's still a local small project with a certain purpose into it. Mm -hmm. So I have a feeling that, you know, people who will be uh, within that project and we will be using that wallet on daily basis will start, you know, interacting with the blockchain on, on daily basis without actually knowing too much about the blockchain, just using yes. it like we are using internet, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that is what will lead to the mass adoption eventually. So the more projects like that we have that, that are close to our everyday life, that uh, the barrier to entry for it is not uh, very big, like you know, right now, if someone wants to buy a cryptocurrency and open a wallet, etc., it's pretty, so pretty complex. Oh yeah. um, so Absolutely. the more projects like this, the easier and faster the mass adoption will go. Uh, okay. Why do you think we don't have enough of those projects which have a low barrier to entry for a regular person and don't bring a practical everyday implication and positive change to our lives so people would instinctively kind of be drawn and attracted to those, to use so, those? So I think it's because the industry and the technology is really young and I don't mean to say that from the technology not good enough sense. Mm -hmm. I want to say it from the maturity of the people that are involved since. Because okay. if you want to implement something, you need to have a financial driving force behind it, right? Mm -hmm. So yep. if that company in Mexico has enough money to pay a development company like myself, or if the government has enough money in their budget, and by the way, the Canadian government, I mentioned this, they're doing already identity on the blockchain, and they now have a request for proposal for up until uh, middle of November, for mm -hmm. companies to provide them with identity on the blockchain uh, architecture and then projects. Yeah. If you don't have the budget and the financial force behind it, nothing will happen. So with the ICOs, uh, it was about, you know, a lot, a lot of times entrepreneurs that had no experience and yeah. the ones that had experience, it was kind of like dwelling in uh, being a little bit, um, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't complete. It was a little bit mad water. It wasn't completely clear what exactly yeah. their intention is. So it was almost like divided between the really geeky project protocol level, let me just talk to you about code, to like business people that know how to speak and know how to sound. They're a little bit too sleazy and they're trying to like steal yeah. money. The, the, the industry is really, really super young when you're trying to uh, promote such projects and get investment for that those projects. So if there's no financial force, a true financial force and a true reason, it will never happen. And the only reason why this project is happening and other projects are happening is because they can find two things. Number one is the education. They understand a little bit my blockchain is how can this benefit their users and their bottom line as a business? And of uh -huh. course, give them the marketing buzz as, as we all know, working in PR, it's you can sprinkle some blockchain and poof, yeah. you've got this beautiful pie. Um, but, but the ones that understand it, they can understand that there's actual technical aspect to it. And how do you, and, and again, like how are you going to make money from that project? That particular project has to do with, you can guess, um, a, uh, a percentage of every, every transaction that's happening. You get a commission and that's how you're able to fund it. So they have to come up with a financial force. They have to have the understanding from the, from the education perspective, what is blockchain? And then they have to have some sort of a purpose as to why they would like to achieve uh, such a project. Okay, makes sense. So um, right now, uh, as we mentioned already, because of the changes in the market conditions, raising money in general and, and the interest in place is, is relatively low because the hype has gone. But still, nevertheless, there are lots of interesting projects around uh, or interesting ideas with, with really good purpose. Um, if, you know, looking back at your journey, if, if you put yourself on someone's shoes who is just starting and has a really good project in his head and is preparing to actually launch it and, and look for investments, 
how would you approach that now if it I was today that, for you yeah so i think I, i can't really give advice about icos and i can certainly not give advice about stos and and uh even ipos right even with the new things that we're doing we're doing uh cross-border payments as well where we combine swift with uh with different uh different conditions that we put on the blockchain to do cross-border payments and we've been offered to go public we've been offered with other investment um it's it really is a personal journey because it depends on who is on your team what is the maturity level do you have mm -hmm. an mvp do you have a revenue model and then the advice that we would that we follow is actually equity investment it's i mean from from what we know it's not really about token investments anymore Mm -hmm. um i mean depending where you're operating we're operating in canada yeah. um or if if you're operating from europe as well it really depends on the jurisdiction but i can no longer and even even when i was in the ico space i can never give advice to those uh, entrepreneurs whether or not they should launch an ico or not i really don't know i think mm -hmm. that again if you go to the fundamentals and you have a good team and a good project and you've proven it for yourself because you always have to put yourself in the shoes of the investor Like, yeah. would you actually invest your money? If you would, great. You probably want to see when is your return of investment. You probably want to see when you're going to start making revenue, right? Oh, yeah, so if absolutely. You, if you look at it from that point of view and you do the projections, but you're very real to the investor and you tell them, listen, I really think I need like $2 million dollars to get this off the ground. Are you willing to believe in me, right? But I can tell you that from having the path of taking traditional investment to going into the um the crypto investment the best thing is when you make money really is <laughs> yeah yeah i mean obviously because it's you a don't, sustainable you don't, business and you don't depend you don't yeah, have and evaluation is is higher and yeah nothing. um so you know uh we, we touched a little bit about the topic of women in tech women in blockchain in general uh, i think You know, it's one thing to be just a woman in the sphere. It's another thing to be a co-founder or entrepreneur in that sphere because it's it's two different challenges at the same time. So I was at an event um, related to women and tech, and we were at a panel where we discussed the fact that actually um, there's not just less women in tech, but also uh vc funds invest way way less in women co-founders or founders um mm -hmm. did you feel that extra burden on you did you feel that because it feels like you know you you were going through the same route you were a woman in blockchain a co-founder mm -hmm. of a blockchain project seeking mm -hmm. a traditional equity investment so how mm -hmm. how was your experience around that because i heard loads of different horror stories unfortunately and few yeah. very happy ones as well so what was your experience so i i personally i said this in other occasions as well i personally don't like to differentiate people based on their gender i think yeah. it's uh, the most uh, advanced way of doing things yeah. is actually looking at people as people because there are some people in this world that they feel that they're both they can be both a woman and a man or they can feel they're a woman but actually a man So it actually doesn't matter um, what you are, uh, how you look, what's your skin color, what's your gender. In today's world, people have to kind of go beyond it. Yeah. But still, having said that, there is uh, there is a balance that needs to be made with regards to bringing women forward. What that means is that when you have a woman in leadership uh, positions, you should probably put that woman forward so for her to be an example. For other women to follow, and the best example is I'm going to give it from the entertainment world. You have Madonna, absolutely amazing. Yeah. You have Beyonce. Never mind, you like the music, you don't like the music, doesn't matter. They're absolutely brilliant, brilliant business women because they use they didn't necessarily use their gender, but they used their talent and their motivation yeah. to push themselves forward. Now, when you take this into the world of technology. It's so important actually for women and for men to take on these roles and take on this education because the people some of them don't even understand it gives you so much flexibility yeah. and I can talk about working remotely there's another podcast happening about digital nomads in a couple of days that I'm going to be interviewed at and working remotely is one of the one of the benefits of working in technology now when it comes to investment 
Um, I have to say that, you know, uh, being the majority of my professional life has been in Canada for the past like 10 years. In Canada, they're very good at being uh, politically uh -huh. correct. So nobody would tell you, ah, because you're a woman, we're not going to give you a chance. But uh, at the end of it all, it really depends who you're interacting with. Yeah. And with some investors that I interacted with, the whole approach was like, they're their little girl. Uh, yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, just trying to kind of like make you a little bit smaller. And I don't know if it's because, I, I actually don't think it's because I'm a woman. I think it's because of a certain personality that I bring onto the stage, onto the meeting room, where it's like, Bah, 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 we're gonna change the world that, that uh, yeah, and yeah, apparently yeah. it's not allowed to say you're gonna change the world when you're like a little tiny uh, looking for investment kind of a gal um but i did <laughs> i do believe in the power of um projecting and believing in what you can do and having yeah. your dreams come true and i think that it's and i and i've been pushing myself in the corporate ladder pushing myself in the entrepreneurial ladder and i believe that men and women they need to, it's almost like taking the leap, right? We talk about climbing the mountain. So yeah. you think you've reached a peak or maybe you're about to go into the peak and you're standing and there's a huge cliff and you feel that you're going to fall. But in fact, if you just jump, if you make the leap, you might yeah. discover that you can fly. And everybody's gonna say, don't jump, don't do it. Oh my God, you're gonna fall, you're gonna crash, you're gonna die. But if you do take the leap, you will have no choice but to fly, right? Yeah. So it's for yeah. it's a message for men and for women. You have to have that drive inside of you, even though everybody is telling you that you're not going to succeed, and they're going to put so many glass doors on top of your head. Oh, you should just fair. you should just go with it. Just go with it and believe in yourself and project it. And project your feelings into the future, and I do believe it will happen. I uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, I would like to to conclude on this positive note because it, it sounds so uplifting and so inspiring. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate that. Uh, I, I really enjoyed and loved our conversation. It was really, really pleasant. So uh, I would like uh, to wish you luck and success with all the projects. I know that, you know, the Harder you work, luckier you get. So luck itself is a bit overestimated, obviously. So uh, luck and success uh, as a result of everything that you're putting into all the efforts, the time and everything else. So, uh, you know, loads of uh, inspiring flights um, ahead of you. Thank you. Thanks a million. Thanks so much, Annie. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.